All right. I've got a, an important sermon here. I had originally planned to do just two sermons on this. Then I did a third because I thought it was important. But today is the fourth one. Today is the fourth sermon, but actually it's a standalone kind of sermon. So you don't have to go. Unless if somebody looks at this and sees part four, it doesn't mean, well, so, oh, man, so i got to go to the beginning. You don't have to. This is a standalone sermon. It's not going to be a complicated one, but it's one you're going to have to pay attention. I'm going to talk about our journey now, because as I went through the other series, we talked about the door opening, the alignment, the time, the opening, bringing us into the promised land. But you know what I never covered? I said, you know, what about why we're in the process of those seven years being in the promised land or leading to the promised land? What do we do about that? So I'm going to talk about that today. And this is going to amaze you. I'm, I'm telling you, you're going to love this sermon because this is an encouraging sermon. And the call that God gave each one of us is going to be so important. The journey to our place of safety. Now, now we're talking about before the promised land, right? We're in the journey period. Our place of safety is the journey, is what I want to bring out today from Scripture. All right, so that's, our pro that's what we're going to talk about today. Now I want to bring in what we've been going through in sermons in the past. Just real briefly, I want to lay the foundation and I'm going to build upon this. This is not a timeline sermon, but I'm going to use the timeline to give us the principles of what I'm bringing you today. So now what we're looking at here, this came in from, I think, three years ago, from wearing down of the saints. Whenever you see this, we always begin somewhere right here, 2014, 2015, with the blood moons, which is the eighth blood moon since Christ, which means new beginnings is that God began, and what we, we, we believe back then is now beginning to be proved out, is that God began the end. All right, so this was the beginning of the end of days before Christ returns. And that's what appears to be going on right now. In the process, there's three things that has to be done in an overseas or an overtaking of a, a state, a country, a city, or a fort. There's three phases. And in those three phases, God has built them around his 14-year period of seven years of plenty and seven years of lean, just very similar to what he did in the Old Testament with Joseph and Pharaoh in Egypt. And in the process of change from one, from one control to another nation in control, from Satan's control until Christ returns and it's his kingdom, 14 years, there's three, pro, there's pre, three processes that has to take place. First is the siege. In other words, this, you can see this in the Old Testament when Jerusalem was besieged. It took two or three years for that besieging to take place before everybody was weak enough before they actually began to do this. Breach the walls. So then that's the second phase. There's a breach. Something has to change to breach the protection that God placed out there. We see that in Isaiah. God says he took down the walls. You remember the vineyard. He said he removed the protection of the vineyard and the people came into his vineyard. And the third thing is the actual assault. So that's what we're looking at. But remember now, this is physical. So all of these processes are still in place, but we're looking at them mentally and spiritually. What's going on through that assault period. We covered those through series. So if you want to see how this series progressed, we covered in 2018. It was called America under siege. And that was a, that was a multi-series showing how the United States was being assaulted, that our way of life was being removed, and we had become the victims, so to speak, of a nation that now had begun to turn another direction. Then in 2021, we talked about repairing the breach, because from 2020, with COVID, the damage that was being caused, it changed the government. And what the government did, it breached the walls of our protection for Christians, especially God's church. It's the Constitution. So when they breached the Constitution, the wall that God had put in place to protect freedom of speech and our religion was now breached. And all of a sudden they began to attack churches. And we all saw that since 2020 till, till, till now. Now we're at the period of time you're seeing laws changing and they're literally going after people. You see the government doing it. You see the FBI. You see, you see Homeland Security. And you're seeing all over this country 
our protections are now under assault. In other words, we are the ones, as we were, we were told by, I think it was uh, uh, the, you know, the government uh, security, is that the Christians are the real problem. They're the main threat to America today. You know, they're, they're the main threat. So anyway, we've got those three, those three processes going on. So in the middle of all that, now we're at this period of time where I just placed that star. Where is that? In God's timeline, where is that? So let's begin to look at that. This is a scripture that we've been hitting really hard, and I talked about it in News Nuggets last week. We're going to use this now going forward for, for a while going forward because this is important. We didn't realize it, but Jesus is the weatherman, the spiritual weatherman. Luke 12, verse 56 says, You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? See, that's a real problem for people in religion. They don't exactly know where we're at in time. You know, even in the Church of God communities, there's many people saying, oh, we've always had these wars. We've always had these false Christs. We've always, in other words, it's been like this. There's no urgency. We don't need to talk about prophecy. We don't have to talk about end times. And all you're doing is scaring people and families, and especially the kids. So they don't want to talk about it. Well, the problem is things are changing really fast. And if you're honest with yourselves, you know that things have never been like this. Not in our country. It's never been this way. So now let's begin to look at the star. Where are we in time? So I'll clear everything else away, and you'll keep that screen up, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind. Put that screen up and keep it up. Now watch what I'm doing here. I'm moving our time frame over, and I'm bringing us to the period now of where we are to begin the seven-year period and the assault. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this screen now, and we're going to begin to fill in what's going on so that we can use the Scripture to be our barometer to tell us the weather and the conditions of the time we're in. So what is going on here that we need to understand? We do know this much. We are at the beginning before these complete seven seals are taking place. I honestly believe what we just brought up in COP27 just recently, and actually the last sermon we gave, is right here, I honestly believe we have begun to open the first seal. From everything that we've seen and what took place over in, the, in, in Egypt with COP27 and all the religions of the world coming together, and their assault on God's way, I believe that God allowed us to see the first seal. That means that at any given time now, we should begin to see the rest take place. What we need to understand in governing time is that when God starts and opens that seal, it doesn't stop until Satan's put away, ushering in his thousand-year reign. So that means we can get ready for more problems to begin to be undertaken as we move forward, and they will gradually pick up faster and faster and faster. So that's what we're looking at here. Now, there's a problem with this also. In the first four seals, God doesn't give us a time frame. There's no time frame in it. The other problem is we've always had, since the time of Christ in the New Testament, we've always had false Christ. We've also, we've also had famines. We've had wars. And all that's been there since the beginning of time, actually. So now we're at the beginning of Christ, but now things are escalating. So we're going to get to a period now when seal, second, third, and then the fourth begins to take in place. We will understand the weather a lot better than we do now. How long will that be? I'm not sure, but what I'm going to show you today might give us the indication of when. And it's all coming out of the New Testament. When you get to the fourth seal... A fourth part of the planet and the earth is destroyed. Fourth mankind. That's going to be hard to mistake. By that time, there's absolute chaos going on around the world. Following that, they'll have to blame somebody. And they're going to be blaming those Christians who do not believe in climate change and haven't altered their lives and worshiped the earth. They're still worshiping Christ. How dare they? They're the ones causing these problems. Persecution sets in, and now we begin to usher in a time frame of three and a half years when we get to that stage. Somewhere between now and the fourth seal, we will have a more definitive period of time of where we are. 
That ushers in our three and a half years. And we have those first four seals that are always tied in together because you always see them, the four horsemen. You know, you see all that all the time. You'll always see these going through. Now let's put it on the timeline. What does that mean in God's time? You know, God has what he calls the appointed times. And, you know, I've heard people in some ministries in ministry say, well, God doesn't do timelines. Oh, yes, he does. He may not put it on a timeline as I've laid out here. But he's got a better timeline. It's called at the appointed time. He don't need to sit and write this out because it's right there for him. <laughs> he knows exactly what he's doing and when. So now from 2022, we see in 2023, there's two particular years that we need to pay attention to. And I'll show you that from the Old Testament, why I'm separating those two. You see this from Genesis 42, verses 1 and 2. And then in Genesis 43, verses 1 and 2, there's two different events taking place. I've covered this in the past, but it's important to put it in context now as to where we are so we can tell the weather. In other words, what's the condition today? You know, well, there's a storm front coming. You know, it's called the seals. It's called Revelation. There's a storm coming. Now, when we look at these, let's take a look at those verses. 42, verse 1 and 2. Now, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look upon one another? He says, behold, I've heard that there's corn in Egypt. Get you down there and buy us from there that we may live and not die. And it's like, what are you looking at each other? They get food over there. Go get it. We got money. Today, we got money. You look at the world today and there's a flood of money out there. But you know what's happening to that money? It's drying up. And food prices. Now, they're telling you inflation is coming down, but how many people have really seen food coming down? Well, you know why? Because you see, the first two years is talking about food. They were still buying food because why? God had given seven years of plenty. And this world has seven years of plenty. Whether it's real or fabricated or just printed up out of thin air, it's out there. But it's drying up. It's evaporating. The savings accounts are beginning to dry up. Charging's going up. The credit cards are beginning to be filled again. Banks are starting to have trouble with funds. All this is all taking place right now. So this is chapter, verse 42. Chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 42. Now let's look at chapter 43, verse 1 and 2. And the famine was sore in the land, and it came to pass that they had eaten up the corn that they had bought out of Egypt. And their father said to them, Go again and buy us a little food. They still got money. But they don't have much. And food, go buy us a little food. You see here, there's a boldness and there's a confidence. You know, why are you looking at each other? Go get us some food. We've got money. And we'll live next year. We'll plant. We'll be okay. Next year, nothing changed. This is one year later. Nothing changed. Go buy us a little food. All right, let's move that out the way. If we put that on a time scale... From where we are today, if we're moving into seven years of lean like they were doing there, now we have a perfect scenario lining up. We have an exact duplicate of a former and a latter lining up. Food's getting to be more and more expensive. There's getting to be less of it. People still have money. They're still buying food. All that's going on right now, just as it did back there. Now let's go a little bit further. When I get to Genesis chapter 45 and verse 6, things begin to change. Let's take a look at that. Genesis 45 and verse 6. This is when Joseph finally meets his family again. He said, for these two years hath the famine been in the land. What two years? Genesis 42 and Genesis 43. These two years there has been a famine in the land. He goes on to say, and there are yet five years. When you and I look at the end of 2023, by the time we, um, uh, yeah, 23, when we get to, sorry, 24, not 23. When we get to the fall of 2024, and that, when I say the fall, that means I believe it's atonement. You know, if you're Jewish, you would th say it is is the counting of the Jubilee and everything. It all goes on trumpets for them where they have the new year. The only thing I see of the ref refreshing and counting is in atonement, and that's why I use atonement. By the time we get to the fall of 2024, 
That's two full years from now. What happens? We're here. There are five years yet to go in our seven years of lean. What's the weather telling us the forecast for the next two years? I'm telling you, it's not looking good. It's not looking good at all. The financial report came out on Friday where everybody thought things were going good. Well, no, it's already beginning to tip, tailor down. For three days in a row, the stock market has begun to deteriorate. Now they're seriously talking about recession coming next year. They're talking about food problems coming next year. They told us it was starting to fall. I don't know if they did or not. And here's why. I don't see no new people, news people covering it. There's no news coverage about what's going on with food around the world right now. So what's happened in the fall? Well, we don't know, but we do know one thing is they, there was no food to bring people. So I have to assume it didn't miraculously appear out of nowhere that there's problems still growing around the world. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. All right, so now is our foundation. We got, we got the, the two-year separation bringing us into the next five years. So now let's go take a look at that. Here's what we need to understand. If we're to understand God's plan, we must come to terms with and understand God's appointed times. The former and the latter in what we're looking at here. Look at Genesis 18, 14. He said, God told Abraham, at the appointed time, Sarah had a child. How long that was? That was a lot of years. Remember from the first time he told him? Nobody believed it because so many years went by. Do you believe Jesus Christ is coming back? Yeah, of course. So God has an appointed time. Could that time be coming soon? Now you've got a problem because people say, no, I don't think so. Really? But you do believe he's coming back. Why not believe what he showed us? Let's go this way. Exodus 9, 5. At the appointed the time, the Lord shall do this. Now that's talking about bringing the children out of Egypt. At the appointed time. You can't tell me God doesn't have a timeline. So at the appointed time is from the time he gave that to us till he does it. There's a, there's a time period. Habakkuk 2, verse 3. For the vision is yet for what? The appointed time. The Bible is filled with appointed times. Acts 7, verse 17. And when the time of the promise drew near, that's the appointed time. So God has an appointed time. So there. So we, we laid a foundation. There is an appointed time. Let's look at, at the appointed time. Here's Genesis 45, verses 1 through 7. Remember I told you there are five years yet to come. Let's read what it says. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried and caused every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with Joseph and his family. So he made known at that time to his brethren. And he wept aloud, and even the Egyptians outside of the house of Pharaoh heard he was weeping so loud they heard him outside. So Joseph said to his brethren, I am Joseph. They didn't believe him. Probably was all made up. Looked like an Egyptian. Had eye makeup all around his eyes and dressed like they dressed. I'm Joseph. And they didn't know what to say. They were stunned. And he says, does my, my father yet live? And his brother could not answer. So, well, they were, they, were, they were speechless. They were troubled. They couldn't figure that out. All right, so verse 4. And Joseph said to his brother, come here, I pray you. And they came and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, who you sold into Egypt. Now he struck a chord. They knew they sold his brother into, into Egypt. They thought he was dead. They had no idea what God was working out. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me here, for God did send you before me to preserve life. Now, this is very important with this going on here. All of this took place, and now it's beginning to come about at an appointed time. Seven years of plenty, seven years of lean. This is two years into the lean. This has taken place. He said, for these two years the famine had been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earring or harvest. In other words, there's no more, there's no more harvesting going on. You know, it's, it's going to change the course of this entire planet is what he was telling them in their day. The appointed time. Genesis 45, 1 through 7. Now, verse 7 is what we're going to cover now. Now, this is very important to understand verse 7. And this is why I'm building this sermon around what I'm telling you today. 
Here's the key. This is the key for you and I today. Verse 7 gives us the purpose of why God did all of that. All of this began at an appointed time. When did it begin? Way back with Abraham. Oh, no, no, no. It began way back with Jesus Christ, the one who became Jesus Christ before he had to recreate this planet. God laid out a plan. This entire plan had to be laid out perfectly for why? For the appointed time at the end for you and I. Had this event not took place, you and I could not tell the weather today spiritually. We wouldn't know what God's doing. We wouldn't have any idea what his plan for you and I are of what's taking place. But by understanding what God did then, we can understand what he's doing now. Verse 7. God sent me before you to do two things. To preserve your posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. By a great deliverance. At the end time when this whole planet is being destroyed. That if God doesn't cut time short, no flesh would be saved. No flesh. Nobody. But by a great deliverance, God is going to rescue his people like he did in the Old Testament. This is key to understand why all this is taking place. It's also key for you because you see you're, you're playing a role in this. Everybody that God calls today has a piece of this plan right now. If we're alive before Christ returns, you have a role. You have a role. Let's go on. I'm being real serious about this because this, this is going to be very uplifting. What your role is in this end time. Looking back, we can see that whole plan. It's easy to look back because, you see, we got the story from the time God told Abraham till they went into the promised land. We got the whole story. But you know what we don't have? We don't have the understanding of the whole story. God's only now beginning to reveal that to his church. Watch what I'm, I'm going to say here. They only had pieces of the story. It was only after two years into the lean years that God revealed to Joseph the purpose of him being in slavery. He didn't know his role. He was simply sold into slavery. And you know what he went through. We don't have to go through that today. But you know what he went through. But it was only after two years that he began to understand his role, what he was doing. But he still had no clue for the future. He was living for the moment then and there. God has been doing the same thing with his church over the centuries. Only revealing what was needed for each generation of the church. You need, we need to grasp this. In other words, what the worldwide went through, God gave the worldwide what they needed for that moment. Look at the prophecy when God told Daniel there's going to come a scattering of the power. You can't have a scattering of a power unless there is a power to scatter. God used them for a couple of reasons. Primarily to build the power to scatter so that when the appointed time comes in the years of lean, he's going to take the fruits from that work and scatter them all over the place. They will then become, and this is where you are today, the role of Joseph. You are fulfilling the role that we see in the Old Testament of Joseph. I want to prove that to you today. I want to prove it to you today from Scripture. Today, God has showed us our part of the plan to understand our piece of the puzzle for salvation. This is going to be absolutely phenomenal when you see this. Everything that's been laid out, nobody knew what their role beforehand for the end time was. Our role is the end time. That means we need to pick up all the pieces that God laid out there. And what he's doing now for his church, he's unopening and unpacking all the mysteries that he's given through the centuries so that you and I can understand our role. Why? Because he will not let us fail. He said all salvation depends on that. If not for the elect's sake, he said no flesh would be saved. So he's laid all this out so you can't fail. Let me tell you something else. People want to talk about going to a place of safety. You're already there. 
you are already in the place of safety right now. No, I hadn't lost my mind. Watch what I'm going to show you today. And if this can't give us confidence, I don't know what will. Let's go on. In like manner, as we transition through our purpose of God's plan for us, we cannot understand it until God reveals it to us as he did to Joseph and ultimately to the entire family, including his dad, Jacob, and Israel. Nobody knew God's plan. They simply woke up every day, and whatever happened, they went through it. And that was it. Why did God go through the revealing of these, these dreams and the interpretations? Why did God give that to, to, to Daniel? So Daniel, write it all down. And he said, but I don't know what I'm writing. He said, it's not for you to know. He says, write it down. I'll tell Peter. When it's time to know, they'll know. That's not your job. It's our job today. Where are we going through? So how is God doing this today? How's God doing that for us, you and I today? 1 Corinthians 10 tells us all these things happen to them for examples, and they're written for our admonition. Who is that? To the ones who the ends of the world has come. That's us. Now that just proved what everything I've told you up to now. Everything God did, everything he laid out, every plan, every purpose, every detail that he put through in these people's lives was for one reason, for you. Why? So you don't fail. In other words, he has moved us. He has called us. Put us where? He has already put you into a place of protection. Why? Because you have a plan. He has a plan for us. It has to be done. It can't be done without him protecting us. You have just begun in entering into that place of safety. But we need to grasp it now with our mind what I'm talking about. Let's go on. Let's look at what God did with the Israelites. And then see what God is doing with us. All right, so here's the chart that I brought you from before. All right, we got it all together here, right? I found it interesting as I was studying here. You know, when I read these two, you know, I always stopped at the verse two. I never went any further. I mean, I've read it before. Don't get me wrong. I have. I mean, you all have. But you see, the next couple of verses tells us the story. See, the reason I didn't go here yet, it wasn't time. Now it is. To explain what God's doing, you have to go to the next verses. Let's begin in, in chap chapter 42. Chapter 42, beginning verse 4. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, went not with his brother, and Jake, Jacob said, peradventure, mischief shall befall him. Remember? So when they went to go get the food the first time, Jacob said, no, you can't take your brother Benjamin. He's got to stay here with me. Something could happen to him. So they all went without him. So, But they were told by Joseph, don't come back here again without him. Verse 4. Why was that? Well, God had a plan. He was beginning to move his people where he wanted them. Why? To protect them. That's why he did that. Look at, look at the next chapter. Same thing. I quit reading in verse four, chapter 43. Now I'm reading a little further again. Look at verse 4. But he says, if you will send our brother with us. Remember, this is where he told him, go buy us a little food so we can live. And he says, but if... You will send our brother with us. We will go down and buy food. They said, but verse 5, but if you will not send him, we're not going. In other words, Joseph was pretty matter of factly. Don't come back here again without him. He told him, don't come back here without him. God made it a purpose to make sure he moved his people where? To a place of safety. Why would that be a place of safety? Because famine was coming on the whole world. What's coming on this whole world? today famine I mean if this whole world is going to be deteriorating that means God's moving you really where are you going to move to and here's the problem you know what the church is looking for they're looking for a place but God's already moved if you're called you've already been moved where God wants you it's spiritual because he has a plan for you you can't go where God doesn't want you if he hasn't brought you you, you have to go with God. In other words, we have been moving. God has been shifting and moving his people. How has he done that? It's called, Daniel said, through the scattering of the power of the holy people. That scattering, and I did a sermon on it called Pockets of Power. That scattering is moving everyone because there's a greater job coming up. So he has to move you and protect you. All right, so now we're back again with the chart. Here's our five years. What's 
let's take a lesson now, the lesson for the last seven years of lean. Now, we've covered the first two years of what can take place. And if we look at the world today, I'm going to show you just a couple of things today. I'm not going into all the news stories. I'm going to save that for news and nuggets next week. But if we look at these two, we have an exact parallel alignment of conditions as it was back in Egypt right now. No mistake in any of that right now. If people don't believe about Christ coming back in, in the next seven years or eight years or whatever short time, how can you deny the fruits of what's going on? God used the seven years of lean to accomplish seven th several things. I'm just going to take three of them. One, he did that to confirm the covenant with Abraham. All right, here's the covenant. He said to, to Abraham, you know a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in the land that's not theirs. He's going to move Jacob into Egypt. All right, and he's going to serve them there, and he's going to affl afflict them 400 years. Remember, they came out 430 years to the self same day. First of all, he did that to confirm his covenant. Second, is to confirm the end time events. 1 Corinthians uh, 10 showed us that. It was for our admonition. At the end time, what's coming? Babylon. Babylon, for all nations have drank of the wine and got rich off her merchandise and partook, partook of her delicacies. See, at the end time, Babylon is going to be the system in place that controls the whole world, just like Egypt was the system in place that controlled the whole world at the end of those seven years. We have that coming on again. All right, that's all coming on again. And the third thing, and this is the most important of all, it's a mystery to his end time church. And I'm calling this a mystery to the end time church because we didn't understand this in the past. But it's obvious today what's going on. Genesis 45, verse 7. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity in the church and to save your lives by great deliverance. In the overall picture, we understand Matthew 24. If not for you and I, no flesh would be saved. So God has called us collectively as a body to fulfill Matthew 24 to preserve life. But individually, there's something even more important going on right now. The mystery. God moved them to their place of safety to preserve their lives and posterity. Now, that's hard to imagine. Where did he move them? He moved them in Egypt. Now, when you look at what Egypt is, that's bondage. Did, did I just say that? Right? Did, did God move them to bondage to protect their lives? Yeah. Yeah, they were put in that place. At the end time, Revelation, it says, is going after the, Satan's going after the elect and shall overcome them. I couldn't answer that question. Why is God going to let that happen? To preserve life. You realize that? God is going to move some of his people into a position like Joseph. Why? To preserve life. All right, you with me on this? Are you prepared mentally to trust your life to God Almighty if he moves you to a place you don't want to go. Joseph was in that position. Look what else here. That was their place of safety. Why was it their place of safety? Because the whole world's being deteriorated. They're all going to starve. If you didn't go to Egypt, you didn't get food from them, you died. And back then, you don't read it in the Bible, but you have to know. There were people outside the limits of Egypt who didn't have food, who didn't have animals, who didn't have land. They died. So God moved them somewhere so they would not die. Why? Because that's the judgment of God on this planet that's coming. So God brought them, when the judgment on this planet begins to destroy everything, God's moved them somewhere that he protects them. So they don't have to suffer with the rest of the world. In the past, we've looked for a location but that isn't what God's showing us from his Bible. That isn't what he's showing us. Look at this. The mystery. Now, what is the mystery? Where did God send Joseph to prepare to save their lives? To bondage. And in that bondage, he rose. He became second in charge. It happened to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I'm telling you, it's going to happen with God's people if you trust him. He's going to move us to where he can use you because there's a job coming. I'm going to show you that job at the end of this. 
But you're going to have to trust him. People say, I don't know why this is happening to me. Well, I don't know sometimes either, but I know God's hands in it. I know God's hands in it. Now, let's go on with this mystery. When he moved them to their place. They went into captivity. God used the famine to bring them to their place of safety. When the whole world would suffer the famine and come under a one world bondage, that's what's going to go on in this world, is this Babylonian system is going to overtake everyone. The beast power is going to begin to control it. Run by that woman on that beast <laughs> till the beast power kills it. So it was given him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him and over all kindreds and tongues and nations. See, that's what's coming. Why? Because that's what happened back then. We can see that. It's clear today. We can see that. They can't see it today. But you have to put on your weather forecasting. It's the Spirit of God. Like he told the Pharisees, you don't know what day it is. You can tell the weather, but you have no idea. They didn't know the Son of God was standing in front of them. Now, coming out of captivity, later in their place of safety, God used the blood of the Lamb that would rescue them from tribulation and bring them out of Egypt. Where's your place of safety? You've been baptized? You've gone through repentance? You carry the blood of Jesus Christ? No matter where he takes you, your place of safety carries with you. It's called the Spirit of God. Is the blood of Jesus Christ. Quit looking for a place and live in the places that he's brought you to right now. We're in that place of safety. We're under those wings of God right now. I don't have to go anywhere to have a place of safety. I have to only go to my knees with Jesus Christ. Is this making sense? I'm looking puzzled eyes here. I don't, I don't know if I'm confusing them. I'm going real slow with this because this is important to understand. This is a very important sermon. It's not a complicated one. But it's important for you to know where you stand. Because you're going to have to make choices and decisions. The Israelites remained in Goshen, in Egypt, until the plagues were finished. God didn't take them somewhere else when the plagues came upon the earth over there. The most powerful nation on the face of the earth, God brought them to ruin. While they were right there in the middle of it. He didn't take them out. He left them where they were. He left them where he brought them. Where has he brought us? He's brought us under the wings of Jesus Christ, his blood, his sacrifice. If they left the door, they went outside, they had no longer protection. You want to walk away from God? You man, do it on your own. Get out of here. You know, don't bring us any other problems out there. <laughs> and where are you going to go? No matter what happens, if you're in the church, it's happening to everybody worse out the church. Where are you going to go? At the end time, we see God doing that just as he did with Joseph and the former. God called his elect in like fashion of Joseph. God moved us to where he wants us to prepare for those that he will call and preserve their lives and posterity. How does God protect his elect before that time? Right, right now, how is God protecting you and I? You notice the persecution going on a lot of Christians around the world is not affecting God's church yet? See, God's keeping you secret right now. They say, wow, we don't have millions of people and thousands of people coming to the church like it did back then. Because it's not time yet. God's still moving us around where he wants us to get ready for that time. Daniel 12, 7 says this. When I heard a man clothed in linen, he was upon the waters of the, the, the river. And when he held up his right hand and he held up his left hand to heaven, so he swore to him that lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half time. That's very clear. The only time you see that kind of writing is shown in time. We pick it up in Revelation in a couple different ways. We're showing the time that when this event takes place, it's at the end. During a three and a half year period of tribulation. So what goes on here? When he have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. People here all the time say, I wish we could all just get back together. And they want me to help them. I said, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I can't fight this verse. You know, God's a lot bigger than I am. He's not putting his people back together until after he comes back. It's not because we can't get along. But by the way, we really can't get along. <laughs> I hate to say that. <laughs> but you put two different churches together and you got an argument going on. This is crazy what we do here. God knows that. He says, look, you get over in your corner. You get over here. We're going to use everybody. 
In Revelation, it shows seven churches. It's complete. God has got a plan for all his people because he scattered them. He doesn't scatter them so he doesn't use them. He scatters so he can use them. So when you're praying about the churches of God, pray that everybody's successful. Don't say, well, I want to do more than him and I'm better than they are. That's a real problem you do that. See, God has got a plan here. And he's working it out. And he does this plan by scattering everybody. Why is he doing that? Well, let's look at verse 8 through 10. And I heard and I understood not. He said, oh, oh my Lord, what, what shall be the end of these things? Daniel said, I, I'm, I'm writing it down, but I have no idea what I'm doing. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed and sealed to the time of the end. And many are going to be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now we get a verse in here that brings out Revelation. It talks about this innumerable multitude of people who comes out of tribulation who's washed their robes. In other words, they begin to put on the blood of Jesus Christ. So what he just told him is, look, it's not for you to understand. When I scatter everybody at the end, they're going to know. They're going to know. And so I always wondered that like if you go into a place of safety who's going to care for all these people who have never known the truth yet when all this begins to go down so here we have verse 10 part of the responsibility of God's end time church is likened to Joseph's calling is to be ready in advance to care for those in God's future family just like Joseph did to preserve the lives and posterity of those purified out of tribulation so what do I mean by that in other words, God sent Joseph into Egypt first. And he went through everything he had to so that Joseph would be ready for when the time came at the appointed time. The appointed time is approaching. God gives him the Pharaoh, the dreams, the plenty and the lean. Nobody else had that. Jacob never had it. None of his kids ever had that. Only the ones that God had given the truth. Even now, in the churches of God, many of the truths I'm sharing with you today, many of them do not know and reject. They don't understand what God's working out. But what God is doing, he's calling people in advance for doing what? What he's about to bring the rest of the family into protection. That means all around the world, this innumerable multitude that God's going to call, God will have placed little Joseph's scattered all across the planet to be ready so when the lean comes God will draw those innumerable multitudes out and send them to his Joseph's all over to prepare and to care for those people those that are making themselves white with the blood of Jesus Christ this is the job he's given to his church today why would he scatter us and it just happens to be at the same time frame as it was in the Old Testament. Let's go on now. I'm in great shape on time today. Preserving life in the latter years. Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22. For then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And I got this in big letters. How does God protect his elect before that time? You know, it could be God will send us into bondage. There may be some of us who will go to jail. There may be some pastors who are in the pulpit and they're preaching against the LGBTQ and against all the sins of this world or the leadership of this world, and they will come in and they will drag them out, and they will bring them before the magistrates, and they'll put them in jail. And God will have moved that person the way he wants him. And you will see a ministry going, and those being called, just like with Joseph. Can you handle that? Can you handle, can you be ready for that if that happens? What about if God allows you to be persecuted? or beaten, or mortared. There will be some that will go through that. From what I see here, though, most will not. But there is coming a mortardom. When we were up in Georgia last week, when there was talk, someone I was talking about, and, and the, the person on the other side of the table, and they were talking about a place of safety. And I said, if God doesn't give you a place of safety, 
Can you, and I looked straight in the eye, I said, can you exist for three and a half years in bondage, persecution, or prison? So you have to make that choice. Never forgetting when you make that choice, you're already in a place of safety. In other words, there's nothing they can do to you. They could take your life, but they can't do anything to you. You're already saved. This church, when you say, once saved, always saved, no, uh -uh, you can lose it. No, you can definitely lose it. I'm not saying that. But if you have the blood of Jesus Christ and you die with the blood of Jesus Christ, you die saved. Judgment begins with the house of God right now. And God's going to allow you to be tried and tested. Why? To refine you so he can use you at the end time. So now we come back to the chart. We'll begin to wrap this going through here. We don't have much longer. The last seven years of the Jubilee cycle. Those seven years covers the time of Genesis 45 through 47. So I would recommend when you go home sometime this week, go read those chapters. See that what's taken place during those years and the transition of power and control. And you know what you're going to find? You're going to see when the whole world is suffering and dying because there's no food and all the salvage and the problems they got. As the whole world comes under bondage, God had already moved his family where he wanted them to save them, to protect them. So as the whole world deteriorates, you know what happens here? The house of Israel grows. They strengthen. They become powerful. They live in the most prosperous place on the face of the earth and the best of all the lands. So God brought them into a place to put them into bondage, and at that time, they become the greatest and the strongest on the planet in the middle of all of that. And God can do that to his family. It's incredible what God's showing us here. If all the rest of duality is true, why not this? Why not that? So in other words, you have to be ready to either accept what God brings you or the problems that you'll face during that time. So now we're at 22. We're looking forward to 23 and 24 to the, we get to the five years. If events hold true with what we are witnessing in the past seven years, we will continue to see hunger during these next two years and the migration of people all over the world leading into the famine, plagues, the pestilence, and the wars. All of these things are beginning to lead into what? The next five years. Now, I'm going to show you, this is a, an insight I've got. I can't per, give you the person's name who sent this through another minister of another church organization who sent that to me this week. He manages these bakeries, big bakeries around the country, one of the biggest in, in uh, America. Rising Bake Country, they supply, supply Krispy Kreme, Walmart, and many, many other large uh, stores. He said, this is coming from the manager who runs this. He said they're struggling to get raw products. They've had to actually close a couple of their plants. They're expecting food to double or triple by the end of next year, 2023. How come the news isn't telling us this? See, the news is telling us things are getting better. The supply chain is getting better. Inflation is coming down. Really. He said sugar is going to be especially short in supply. I'm telling you, you go get some sugar. Put it away if you need it. You're going to need it, so it's going to be in short supply. And if you get it, you're going to pay a lot for it. What do we see in Genesis 42 and 43? They had money those first two years. You know what they were running out of? Food. That means the price of food goes up as the food begins to run out. He goes on and says this. Accordingly, this is from this, this man who runs this plant. According, they're running on existing stocks right now. In other words, they're, building, they're still selling the food to the stores because they had stock. But they're running out of the stock. He said when the present stocks are exhausted, there will not be enough raw products coming in to replace the exhausted inventory. So what do we see in 43? Genesis 43? This is go buy us a little food. In other words, your shelves are going to start looking emptier. You follow what's going on here? And what I'm showing you is God has laid out a, an exact timeline of alignments of the former to the latter, where you are today. And if we can't see it with our spiritual eyes, we'll never be able to be a weather forecaster like Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about spiritual weather forecaster. 
He said, when that happens, prices are going to soar. Now, he's already said they're going to be two to three times. But after that, they're going to soar. Also, he said this, and this is, closed, this is closing his quote. Also, the war in Ukraine is causing serious food shortages. Well, we, we covered that. We know that's what's going on. Ukraine is the breadbasket for Europe and Asia. They supply 25% of the food for Europe and many of the Asian countries over there. They're not able to plant because of the war of what's going on. Additionally, Russia and China supply much of the nutrients and the fertilizers for the world to grow future crops. So not only can they not plant, they don't have the fertilizers they need to plant in the future. So we're going to begin to see our planet do what? Seven years of lean. More and more and more difficult and difficult as time goes. Am I laying out a clear enough picture? Now we're going to cover more of the news events in the, in the, in the news and nuggets. Today is showing you your place of safety where you are going into these seven years. Now let's look at that where we are today. Let's begin to wrap up what I'm looking at. So here we are looking at going into the next five years. So the lessons for the last seven years, what do we conclude from all of this? Well, there's a lot to conclude from this. The first thing is, is this, is that God's got you under his wings. Not in the future, right now. Second, he's going to move you spiritually where he wants you. In other words, can you come from today, 2022, to we move into these next five years can you spiritually be ready to handle wherever God takes you? Whatever he allows to happen to you. Well, we all want something nice to happen to us, but what if it doesn't? What if we have to go to prison? What if we have to be beaten? What if somebody is taken out for some nut job that's out there and comes in and shoots up a church? What happens then? You give up on God? Did God forsake us? No. You know, the greatest growth in God's church usually has come right after persecution or during persecution, and it will again. Now, I don't understand all the process of that. I don't understand the, the apostles, and I always did when, wonder about this. You know, when they brought them to jail, remember? You don't go out there and preach that guy's name no more. Don't ever use that name Jesus anymore. And they beat him, and they turned him loose, and they went out singing praises and joy. Beat to death. They're out there going, man, this is great. I can't believe God let this be persecuted. And I'm reading that as a young man saying, these guys are nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure that out. It's like, what? Is that they love God enough to know that God would let them be the example to save other people's lives. That's hard to fathom. Can you do that? Well, you never know it. God's, he's not going to let you go through more than you can handle. He'll not let you do that. Now, this is where we get in trouble. What do we conclude from this? This is where we can get in trouble. Trying to predict or guess when these events are going to happen. Now you're in the prophecy. And you know why we never had to change the last seven years of what we've been teaching? Because we never prophesied anything. All we're trying to do is tell the weather. Where are we today? What has God showed us? We're walking on safe ground. What have I done today? I haven't forecasted anything. I'm just showing you what God did. And saying he's going to do it again. Because why? I didn't say it. He did. And this. Look at 2036. And I don't know if you paid attention to this. I brought this up on the screen uh, several months ago. What if he doesn't come in 2029? See, on the radar, there's actually another year. Another Shemitah year showed up. Now, I don't know what that means yet. But when we went through it here, and we covered those seven Shemitah years, where the ninth of Av fell on a Sabbath day or right at sunset, there were seven years in a row. The seventh is right here. So what if God doesn't come here? But you said, Tom, seven years. I said, yes, I did, and I stand by that. But that doesn't mean Christ is coming back at the end of seven years. This is the, maybe the last full seven years. I still think he's going to be back by 2029, 20, 20, 30, 31. I do, because everything points to that. Can I guarantee and prophesy? No. See, because you know why? Because I got something else on the radar over here. I don't know what that means yet. May not mean anything. But what if it does? 
What if we go to Revelation and God says, go again and warn the nations? So he's just about to blow the trump here. God says, nope, don't do it yet. I got more people I want to bring into my kingdom. First resurrection. Go do it again. And he extends the time. That can happen. So you live for today, but you plan that it might go on. You see, because it's there. When I put that together, I said, well, why 2036? How does that show up? When I get to 2034, there's also another moon thing going on out there. I don't know how that plays into it. We don't have that information yet. But it might come. I don't know. So now, let's go on. So what do we do? We start with what we know from Scripture. That's what we did today. We don't have all the answers yet. But what we do know, we go through those scriptures. So here, we be, let's begin to wrap it up now. So what can we conclude from this? Right here. Oops. All my clicks aren't right. Preserving life in the latter years. This is the exact same pattern and time scenario that you find God showed us from the Old Testament with Joseph. If you go back and you forget everything else I told you today and you simply begin building your own timeline, this is what you're going to come up with. If you go back to the Old Testament, you can take the two timelines, you can lay them over one another, and they will match perfectly. They will match perfectly. Why is that important? Because God says, if you want to know what I'm going to do, go look and see what I did. We did that today, and it brought us right here. Everything we see, this is on the bottom of the screen, everything we can see, it appears that God is moving his people into position to prepare for the greatest work of the church since the days of the New Testament. Can we grasp that? Peace of way, but we don't have a lot of people coming into churches. We want, to, we want to fill our churches. You will. Just be patient. At the appointed time, God will. He's not doing it now. Why? Because he's got to keep his church hid to get the message out. So you don't hit the mainstream yet. But when he's ready... When he's moved everybody where he wants them to go, they will come. The time of the innumerable multitude, by the time of the second, third, and the fourth seals, the world is going to be in total disarray, especially the fourth seal. 25% on that fourth seal will be, will be dead or dying by the time of the fourth seal. Right now, God is positioning his people in their place, and I wrote in with a parenthesis, in their place of safety like Joseph. How are we like Joseph? He moved where he wants them. Joseph had no idea what God's plan was for him. He knew as a child when he had these dreams and they began to mock him and laugh at him. He said, all my brothers are going to bow down to me. And even Jacob says, am I going to bow down to you too? Yeah, that's what happened. See, Joseph was the type of Christ. He was like the Savior and he was showing every example what was going on there. And so God is moving each one of us into place to do what? Prepare for the people who are coming out of bondage and tribulation, just like he did with Joseph. So God, he moved them to their place of safety like Joseph. Before the tribulation begins, that means if he's doing it before the tribulation, you're already in your place of safety. You don't have to go look for where he's taking you. You're already there. You know, we had a... We had a uh, a loved one passed away this year and this week and we buried her on Wednesday. She is not only in her place of safety, she is secure with God. She didn't have to worry about what's coming. When she wakes up, she's going to be looking for the rest of us. I told that story at the funeral. That was the first time since I've done this and there was like almost 200 people there and they were very religious. They're very they're very refined. They were excited. They're Christian people. You know, they don't have the truth as we got, but they were people trying to follow God. And they talked about being in heaven just briefly before I got up there. And I never spoke about heaven. I said, she's asleep. And she's going to be a resurrected when Christ returns. In that room, they were singing. Some people would get up and they were, they were not dancing, but they were waving their hands and they were praising God. That room became dead silent with 200 people in it. And I looked in her eyes, and I said, it's the first time I've seen this at a funeral I've preached. That affected some of them people. Because you see, no longer could they deny the scripture that they just heard, but they had to now challenge this thing on heaven. Whether they realized it or not, there was dead silence in that auditorium. That's the, I told Audrey when I came home, that's the first time I've seen that. 
I've done this before, and the people out there, I tell them that she's asleep, and they're, they're, they're in a grave and be resurrected. Go, hallelujah, they're in heaven. <laughs> and I'm saying, like, how can they get that from what I just said? This time was different. And I have to wonder, could some of those people be some of the innumerable multitude? Will God take that conscience that was just pricked and put them in the Bible to begin looking? I don't know. But I've not seen that before. But that room became deadly quiet during that time. Some of you, you're shaking your heads there. You were there. You saw that. I said, this is really unusual. And I was about to say, I said, I said, let me tell you one more thing. And I caught myself right after I said that. I said, no, I don't want to go there. Then I didn't know what to say. I didn't open it up. A, so I, did, I just kind of closed it out. Because then I wanted to talk about something even more important. I said, no, this is not the time. There will be people throwing rocks in here at each other. <laughs> and that's not the time at a funeral. <laughs> You know, the time of the funeral is to comfort one another and to show them the truth. And that's what we did. And I thank uh, uh, Miss Gloria for allowing us to be there with the family to represent her family. So now, let's, let's conclude this. In conclusion, defining God is moving his people to a place of safety. It isn't a location. It is your state of mind. Your heart and your soul it is the spirit that God has placed in you that becomes your place of safety. It won't matter what he has called you to do or what you're called to endure that makes a difference because you are already in your place of safety. Psalm 118.6 says this, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. So this will conclude our Shemitah's gateway into the millennium. The journey, your journey to the place of safety has already begun and you are already there.